Welcome to uh, King Street, South Carolina. We are at the historic site of the Thorn Tree House built in 1740. And we're here this weekend to help the folks of King Street celebrate the history of their area. Uh, it has a very deep colonial history. And uh, we as reenactors during the Revolutionary War and colonial periods, we are proud to be here to help with this participation of showing some of the living history and some of the things that people did in the 18th century to make a living and to get by. And uh, I appreciate you people coming. I appreciate you people watching. It's been a wonderful weekend, a little bit wet, but it is what it is. And you have to love it to do it. And everyone come and visit the Thorn Tree House, visit King Street. It has a lot to do, a lot to see, and a lot to learn. If you haven't done it, you've missed a lot. I am here today representing a life skill in the 18th century, and the life skill is called joinery. And a joiner, and you may have heard of, of somebody with the last name joiner, that's where the name comes from, it's a trade name. A joiner is a woodworker who builds furniture or other items out of wood. And how that happens is take various pieces of wood and cutting uh, designs in the wood that are opposite one another to make a joint in the wood. So we actually join pieces of wood together to make things and that's why we call that a joinery. And for example, we have a, a table under construction here and the secondary wood, the pine, is joined into the walnut to make the drawer for the table. And then the table legs are put together with, with what we, what's called a mortise and tenon joint, and that's the one I demonstrated earlier. So from the, with the mortise and tenon joint, you can make chests, tables, stools, chairs. Um, it's, a very, it's a very common joint. And then the dovetail joint. So I brought some of the tools of the trade, being an inclement day and I could not bring the joinery. So I brought uh, just some of the antique tools with me that we use. We use period tools in reproducing furniture and, and other items. So the, the first item here is a Philadelphia, a copy of a Philadelphia stool that was made in 1750. Uh, that's copied in South Carolina black walnut that grew in Fairfield County. The original stool was made of walnut as well. So being from Philadelphia, that's more high style. And the person who made that probably wasn't referred to as a joiner, but a cabinet maker. And the, the second piece is done in mahogany. And it's a Chippendale, country Chippendale uh, chair, side chair. The, the original that it's copied was made in Prequimans County, North Carolina, about 1760. And here we have um, a table under construction. This table is being made in walnut as well. It's um, what you would call a bedside table with drawer. And th this table would be the, the basic joinery project because uh, you would get experience making the dovetail joints and the mortise and tenon joints, and those are the basic joints for, for woodworking. For example, the chair and the stool are both made out of uh, mortise and tenon joints. Uh, the folding table we made also. Now, and we have some copies of George Washington's camp stool. So when we move to this side, we're to, to more camp furniture. And the two stools um, copied after George Washington's stool. And then we have a British officer's mess kit. And the mess kit was a chest or a campaign chest, it might have been called, that held his, uh, some cooking uh, items and food stuff, as well as uh, service for uh, serving a fine meal. A British officer bought his commission, and so he would bring to the field with him items that reflected his origin and his wealth. So, so a British officer 
uh, might have a campaign chest like this. George Washington had a campaign chest too, but it wasn't this elaborate. So it's his tea caddy, and we made all of these things out of poplar. And of course, fine stemware to take into the field. The case is made to stand the, the uh, Carolina back roads in a wagon trip. And is, is a flatware case. And also a lantern we made of that reflects a 18th century period lantern that might have been used in camp too, even though that one's a little hostile. So this, so I am a joiner and represent this very fine 18th century life skill, which was a trade. I would, uh, I, if I'm established, I would have apprentices that work with me and. They would come to me when they were about 12 years old. I would teach them how to write. We'd do basic geometry and math that's necessary to do uh, furniture. And they would learn those life skills. And then when they were competent, uh, they would go out and start their own trade. That's um, how the average person got an edu education in that day. And what I've kind of done here is set up a little simulation of a colonial camp. We got a couple wedge tents, which are copied from the British design. They're called British wedges, bell backs, so they have a two foot bell in the back. These are five man tents. Five men and their muskets sleep in these tents. And you can kind of see the different arrangements, uh, arrangements of uh, cooking utensils, little iron pots, kettles to heat your water for broth and porridge. Uh, Different, different ways to hang your pots. Uh, you see a tin bucket. Quite often they didn't have a tin bucket. And what they had for traveling and marching, I don't have, well we have rain water in it, but we don't have water in it. It's a canvas bucket and it just collapses. And you put it with your gear to travel with. We'll pour that out. What you see here on the table this is a little traveling desk, and you would have some of your small paraphernalia. You, you may see a little piece of modern too in there or whatever, but you keep your little small knives, your tobacco tin, your keys, uh, your 18th century glasses. And it packs up small, it's easy to carry. You can put a lot of stuff in it. Okay. I'm going to slip this on real quick. This is called a cartridge box. These were usually developed for the British Army, but we would capture them or reproduce them. What you've got is a British brown bess. This was the main arm of the British Army. It was very dependable. It's heavy. Uh, it is a musket. It's called a flintlock. You prime your pan, close it, load your barrel, put your ball in, and when you put it on full cock, this piece of flint makes a spark against this frizzing that ignites the pan and fires the weapon. It is a smooth bore, it's not a rifle. So it wasn't very accurate. If you're talking about accuracy of, you know, good shot, 50, 60 yards. Now the other weapon on the table is a rifle. Just like the rifle's accuracy compared to today, when you're shooting 100 yards, 200 yards, 150 yards, this has a rifle barrel. These weapons were feared by the British because of the accuracy, because our men, the militia soldiers, would hide in the woods and shoot the officers and the flag bearers and the drummers to stop their command system. And they said we didn't fight fair, that uh, these were highly accurate in the right hands. Okay, uh, as you can see, we have some lanterns. They didn't have kerosene and flashlight batteries and this kind of thing. And what they would do is put a candle inside. There's different styles. This is called a pierced lantern. And this is called an open lantern. It has a door where you open it, put your candle. It has more light. And reenacting, we have to reenact 
the exact same way they did 250 years ago. We can't use the kerosene and the flashlights and this kind of thing. So when you come on site, you're to see the exact same things that you saw 250 years ago. Our clothing, uh, our exact reproductions, with a lot of events, a lot of our clothes can't even be sewn with a sewing machine. They had to be hand sewn from a pattern. Our wool, you can go to Walmart and buy a wool, 60% wool blend. We have to use 100% wool. Uh, we can't even use a blend. We have an event that we do at House in the Horseshoe, North Carolina. And the home was very much like this. Looked a lot like it. Uh, it was the home of a American militia officer. Well, he and his group took a break to rest at his home. Well, some enemy militia heard about him being there and snuck up on him and attacked him. So the house today has bullet holes all around the house. And the American soldiers surrendered because they were going to burn the house down. And the terms of surrender uh, was that all the militia soldiers would have to sign an agreement not to pick up arms against the king and he got two hours with the captain's wife <laughs> so that's a little piece you might not want you might want to edit that out but uh there's a lot of in, when you're surrounded with the history that we're surrounded by there's so many stories so many little innuendos that only can be passed down by family members so they can be kept and recorded. Otherwise, they'd be lost forever. I'm sure they're a lot better tales than what I just told you. But uh, our history goes back so far. And it's just, for me, a privilege to be able to demonstrate and talk to the public and show them just a little piece of what we do. And, you know, if they walk away with a little bit of new knowledge, you know, how much happier can, can we be as reenactors? I am out here making pottery on a kick wheel, um, which would be a, an instrument that would have been used in the 18th century to make pottery. Um, typically, you would have seen a kick wheel in a pottery studio or a shop. Um, they would be made into the floor. It would not be a portable piece like this is. Um, The pottery wheel was actually one of the very first wheels and has progressed today into electric wheels. Most towns would have had a potter, um, most substantial towns, there would have been a shop that the potters would have worked out of. Um, some of those would have been big, big shops with multiple potters, some would have just had one potter. Um, a lot of the first potters were women um, because the men were busy doing other jobs. Now what are you currently making? It started out as a mug. I think I may make this into a bottle if I can get it to come back in for me. Well to start off you have to get the clay centered on the wheel which is probably the most difficult part especially on a kick wheel to get it centered you have to get the wheel to go quite fast um, and then put pressure on it to center the clay you want to make sure you don't have any air bubbles in it or you're going to get you're going to get a little bit like i've got here there's a there's a piece in here that's thinner because there's an air bubble on the other side so um, I, I just kind of have to work through that but then once you get it centered you open it up and then you start pulling it up and if you can keep it somewhat even on the way up, you might end up with, with a nice piece of pottery. Ooh, nice. <laughs> it's perfect timing, right? Perfect timing. <laughs> Just messed it up. So what I'm gonna do now, it's actually the first time I've done that on this wheel. Um, I'm gonna cut it off and just get rid of it and it'll turn into a small piece or a bowl. Small mug or bowl at this point. That's really funny. Let's see. And then it just pulls right off. Mm. 
What happened is I got it too thin. There we go. Get rid of your air bubble. Yeah, the air bubble's gone now. So at this point, I'll probably just make a mug or a small ball. Haven't quite decided yet. Usually, sometimes I come to the wheel with an idea of what I'm going to make. Sometimes it just becomes whatever it becomes. Um, I've got some plates and pitchers. Really, your utilitarian pieces that would have been used in a kitchen, any kitchen. Um, a lot of the pottery that was made in the 18th century had to be functional pieces because um, the British government did not allow the colonists to make and sell their pieces to make money off of. It was really just pieces that they used. So um, you didn't see a whole lot of pretty pottery coming out of early America. It was really later on that they were able to start making pieces that they would sell to public and, and also export. Um, a lot of the early pottery was was not great pottery. It would not hold water a lot of times. Um, it would just, it would hold water but not for very long. You wouldn't want to put put a mug with, with liquid in it on your very fi favorite piece of furniture because it would likely leach out. Um, this is a horrible mug. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what I've been doing today is working on this powder horn. I'm a gun maker from Plantersville, South Carolina, a little bit lower down from here and uh, east of here. And uh, I've been working on, I build guns, build rifles, do some blacksmith work, uh, do a lot of powder horns. I've been engraving a powder horn here for a client of mine that ordered a gun from me. And I've been doing this horn, doing the engraving on it today while I was here. It'll be engraved something like, something like this horn of mine when I get through with it. This is one that I've carried for, I guess, 25 years. These were used for powder. Horn was sort of like the plastic of the 18th century. It was a material that could be, that was readily available because at that time most cattle had horns and it was easily worked. Horn can be heated and flattened out, used in flat panels. Uh, the term lantern comes from two words, lamp, meaning light and horn. You can take horn and actually separate it into layers and get, get the thin layers that are, are, you can see the light through and use that. Instead of glass panels and lanterns, they had horn panels, but it, they used it for everything. You could, uh, all kinds of things. They could heat it, press it in a mold and make spoons out of it. It was just very usable material, very versatile. It was waterproof is why we wanted it for horns. It won't spark like steel and it kept your powder dry. And that's what you wanted whenever you were, uh, you were out hunting. You didn't want that powder to get wet or your gun wouldn't shoot. When this horn was cut off of the, of the animal, it had a bony core in here. You could either let it dry out and fall out, or you could boil it and get it out. It would turn loose and you could pull it out. So you have this. It's already hollowed out. This end here would be solid to about here. And you'd go about an inch, you'd feel in here and find out where your end, where it was solid at. And you wanted about an inch here to drill through. So at that point, you'd add an inch on, saw it off there. So it might be that big around here. Then you've got all that to work back down into a graceful horn shape again. And then you would make a plug to go in here. And it could be a pretty turned plug like this or left the shape of the horn and fitted like this is. Once you've got that in there plugged, you would put something on it to attach it by, like these staples on this one or a turned piece on this or a nail in it, simply a nail or a screw in it. Then whenever you got it to this stage, a lot of them were dyed on this end. And I have dyed this horn. This horn is naturally the color it was. This one has been dyed just to highlight the, the engravement here, where it's been carved down and stepped down. This will be stepped down and toothed like this also when I'm through. And then, if, depending on how fancy your customer wanted, it'll be engraved. And it can be engraved this much or, 
all the way around. Some of them had very intricate maps on them. And some of them were done, you can tell they were done by professional engravers. A lot of people call this scrimshaw. Actually, scrimshaw is a 19th century term. It was not an 18th century term. So we say engraving. Most people doing colonial work refer to this as engraving. Because actually that's what it is. Scrimshaw was sailor's art, in the night, whaler's art in the 19th century. Done on teeth and stuff. And a lot of people adapt that same word to horn work, but correctly it's engraving. Uh, but that's how those were done. And they could be anywhere from a very plain horn like this. Very, pl very plain, no, no much, not much decoration, but a little fancier end here. To something like this, which is a little more primitive in design. It's well fitted, nicely fitted horn, but the, the designs on it are a little bit more Native American looking. You know, they look like something that would, uh, that would just not be done so much with an engraving tool but burned in there. And they engraved man, burn them with signs that meant something to them. But most of it was very homespun looking, like the deer on this. You know, it's kind of hard whenever you start doing stuff like this, if you've trained yourself all your life to try to draw something accurately, to go back and kind of undo some of that so that it looks a little more uh, untrained. This is Gamecocks from the Hogarth print. That's where that came from. In England at that time, when those Hogarth prints were done, Gamecocks, they would, they would cut all the feathers he didn't need to rise up higher to fight. And that's how they looked. It made them look like quail or something to me when they were fighting and had their feathers ruffled up. But those are two Gamecocks. Out here doing today a little blacksmithing to exhibit, demonstrate how we, uh, some of the old timers used to make their own tools and they're cooking utensils. This that I'm making right now is a squirrel cooker, rabbit cooker on one end and it'll hold a pot on the other end in case you want to make coffee or cook a can of beans. We actually have a lot of fun out here sometimes. It started out kind of rainy and miserable around here, but the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day today, so. What I'm doing right now is just trying to draw this metal out to make a fork on this end. And if you can make it with a piece of clay, most of the time you can make it with hot metal. But we enjoy coming out, doing reenactments, demonstrating our skills. I love coming out and working with these other uh, blacksmiths because they have more knowledge than I do and every day's a learning experience for me. We've made cooking iron sets, utensil sets. Uh, just a while ago, we made a uh, thing for a gentleman that works in the uh, cemetery so that he could find uh, burial plots in the cemetery. So if uh, they come with an idea, if we can make it, we'll help them out. There was no money transpired between people in most cases. You had a blacksmith, you had a woodworker, you had a leather craftsman, and they all traded back and forth their uh, skills, and that's how they survived. The people that had farms, they traded food for the things that they needed. And of course, a stranger come through town and needed something. Most of the time, he had to pay for what he wanted. But for the local people, most of the time, it was just a barter system. And the different parts of the anvil can be used to make most anything. You can take a long rod and right here in this little gap right here, you can tap it as you move it around and you can make as big a circle as you would like to have. And that's how a lot of wagon wheels were made on a much bigger anvil. And a lot of people need to come out and see how our forefathers paved the way for us and the risk 
they took and the hardships they went through to make life better for us. A lot of tools that uh, we have today started right here.